smaller group today, which I'm not used to, but it's great to see lots of new faces. Um, my name is Denise Matthews. I'm the chapter director of Startup Grind. I run my company, One Media and Events, and I'm also the operations manager of the Blockchain Innovation Center. So I do a few things. Anthony and I have met before, but recently I met David Martinez, who is the founder of Hemp Fashion, and I was fascinated with the amount of initiative that he had and the fact that he's latched onto something which I think is going to be a very exciting industry, especially in Gibraltar. So we're going to have a little bit of a talk today and you guys are going to tell us more. Um, I'm sure that's what you're all here for. So um, jumping right to you, David, you have a BA honors in business and accounting, finance. However, even before university, you were already drawn to the world of entrepreneurship and participated in things like Young Enterprise in Gibraltar. So was this something you were naturally drawn to? Uh, I think since I was really young, I've always wanted to work for myself. I didn't think I was ever going to work for anyone. It was a short spell that I was uh, employed. But uh, like you mentioned there, when I was in Bayside School, we had the Young Enterprise. Uh, I'm not sure who knows what Young Enterprise is, but basically it's like an initiative where they uh, encourage students in, in school to start up a business, run it with their friends, and uh, just teach them everything, what it is, leadership, actually being employed, the, the different relations you have. And it was weird because sometimes you'd have your friends and then the next moment he'd be your managing director and he'd fire you. Uh, but anyway, that was a good experience. Um, we actually won in Gibraltar. We had a company called 2.0, which was a custom corporate USB pen drives. Um, and I think we sold 4,000 USB pen drives in Gibraltar. Then the second phase of that was like a um, custom corporate, uh, sorry, custom uh, Rock of Gibraltar pen drives. Apologies for the nerds, it's the first time I do public speaking. <laughs> Apologize in advance. Um, and then we, we won in Gibraltar, we won in the regionals in the UK, and then in the whole of the nationals, uh, we came, I think it was fourth, and we won the best financially performing company. So that was the start-ish. Yeah. And you said your friend became your managing director, and then later on they weren't I was the managing anymore director. either. <laughs> <laughs> I, <laughs> I was the one firing. <laughs> it, can, it can happen in business, right? So, Anthony, just... Tell us a little bit more about your background. You're, you're a partner at Hassan's. Um, I know your history because you've been one of our guests before. But uh, just tell us, was this something that you always aspired to, Hassan's being one of the biggest uh, law firms in Europe? I was exposed to Hassan's pretty early because of my dad was, it was uh, one of the early employees there. Um, I think he was the third employee at Hassan's, um, which is now employs over 250 people. So um, I was exposed to the profession, the legal profession, very early on. I don't, I wouldn't say it was. I straight away knew that I wanted to be a lawyer. Um, I'm not sure what the situation is nowadays, and I hear it's it's not much better. But certainly, in, when I was in Bayside. Um, we didn't have great career advisors. Okay. Um, and so I remember being in the common room in the building over there, looking through the, the university books and thinking, you know, what are we going to do? Uh, where are we going? Firstly, um, you know, Nottingham sounds good. Let's, let's uh, do they do law? You know, I had already, I had always heard, and my dad certainly said to me, law will at least open doors for you. So even if you don't want to be a lawyer, do a law degree, and you'll take it from there. You'll see what you want to do. So actually, well, I did that. Um, and I must say, the law degree wasn't the most exciting uh, uh, thing to be studying. But uh, when, I, when I went to do the, the bar vocational course at the end of, of the law degree, I, that's when I really started to get exposed to what being a lawyer may feel like and may look like. So we started to, to have real life negotiations with actors. Um, you know, uh, we were put in, in potential real life situations, um, mood cases, all this sort of stuff. So that was actually the first time I thought, you know, well, actually, I might end up doing this. I, may, I, I do quite like it. And then when I moved to Gibraltar and started um, at Hassan's, I realized that everything I had learned is 
actually quite useless. Uh, at least on day one, I was put in an office, started giving some documents to review, and um, you know, I, I thought, wow, there's four years of my life, and which I thought I had, uh, I had learned a lot, but actually none of it I can really put into practice. So uh, it's it's a bit weird to come then and start working in the real world, and uh, and that's really when I really fell in love with my job, and. Um, so no, uh, to answer your question, I, I don't think I did aspire to be a lawyer from early on, but I sort of fell into it in a way as something that um, I may want to do and may open my doors going forward, but I actually fell in love with it and, and now I can't see myself doing anything else. Okay. So David, back to you. Um, locally, you're probably very well known for running one of the best burger businesses in Gibraltar, which is uh, Gourmet Boy. Group. Yeah. <laughs> and, they used uh, to call me the burger boy once in dusk. I had to leave. <laughs> <laughs> so Gourmet Grill is, uh, I think it's, you know, it's very warm-hearted sort of business that people feel, you know, their bellies were very happy with, with your business. So tell us about this experience. How was that for you and, um, and where it ended? Yeah, in 2015, I think it was, I started Gourmet Grill. Some of you might know that restaurant. Uh, we were the first one to have like a full extensive gourmet burger menu with different cuts of meat and just different, doing something different. And the, the, it came because I was at uni and everywhere in uni there was always a gourmet burger place. There's always like a burger shack or something along everything, like a full extensive menu of burgers. And when I came back to Gibraltar, uh, I was actually going to go back to uni again. And I had a friend who was a chef at the time, and I said, look, why don't we just start a burger restaurant? Started looking, started looking and for a, a premises, and I just went literally straight in, didn't even think twice about it. Fortunately, it grew quite a bit. Uh, we moved after to Ocean Village. Uh, that chef, actually a friend of mine, I bought his shares off him, and then I sold that shares to like another investor. That's how we managed to do the move to Ocean Village. And we stayed there for about a year and a half, more or less, I think it was. It was fun. It was very fun. I've sold it now. The restaurant the business is done for me now. Um, but I think it's taught me it's a, lot of, a lot of the things which I learned in the restaurant I'm applying now in Hempassion. A lot of good things, a lot of bad things, a lot of lessons as well, which you take on a smaller scale, which you learn from. And now that like, my next business, Hempassion, were at a level which is a bit bigger than, than Gourmet Grill, I can make sure I don't make those mistakes that I made at, at Gourmet Grill. I think every mistake, uh, if you look at it positively, it's a lesson, it's not a mistake. So it was a, all in all, it was a very good experience. Good. So Anthony, you recently, with the boom of the fintech industry locally, you've been involved with some of the most successful global crypto um, startups and exchange uh, platforms like eToroX. Do you think that startups are playing a bigger role in the Gibraltar market? Yeah, I think so. I, um, you're right. We've we've been working very, very. We've been very involved in the in the blockchain and fintech space, and we have been advising big established players such as eToro and CEX. But also, we've been we've been advising startups in this in this industry. Um, you know, some of them who have gone on to become successful, or at least getting to a, to, to a place where they can be, become very successful in the future. Uh, others which, are, which have struggled in the, in the um, market downtrends. Um, but, but yeah, definitely there is, um, there is a, a, a lot more startups in Gibraltar at the moment, I would say. Um, we're seeing, and not only in the blockchain space, but we've seen them in the blockchain space, which is uh, you know, local, local, three local guys who've um, set up this crypto custodian business um, and who've actually managed to get a DLT license, which I can tell you firsthand is not easy. Um, so, you know, congratulations to them. I think they're doing a great job. Um, you know, they're, they're a startup, of course, and, and good luck to them. Uh, but other than them, you know, we're seeing in different industries such as uh, such as David's and Passion is is now doing very well. Um, so yeah, I think it's it's it is 
Gibraltar is becoming more uh, entrepreneurial, which is not something that I would have associated um, Gibraltar with over the years. You look at places like Israel, um, which they call the startup nation, right? And Israel is every, every corner you turn, there's, an, there's a 26-year-old who's already had three businesses. Yeah. And it's uh, refreshing, actually. You, you, you listen to them speak, and they're unfazed. They're, you know, yeah, we've, we've already gone, this is my third business, the first one I did well, I, bought, I sold out of. Or maybe, you know, yeah, the first one actually didn't go so well, and, and we weren't able to get the traction we needed, and, and it failed. But, you know, they're back on the horse, and, and um, there are loads of success stories over there. And I hope that Gibraltar can, can sort of take a lot of that, a lot of that um, enthusiasm, um, because I think there's a lot of talent here. And Gibraltar is certainly a, a place where, you know, you're able to, to, to start up a business if you want to. We're seeing that also in, in, in the gaming space now. You know, it's notoriously difficult for, for gaming operators, e-gaming operators, to be licensed in Gibraltar if you're a startup. But now, actually, we've seen two startups get licenses. So um, I think we're moving in the right direction, for sure. Good. So we're going to talk about a little bit more about the industry insights and the local opportunities. Um, and we're going to jump straight into hemp passion. So you started that with a partner, Naden Borro, and you won the GFSB Innovation Award this year. So tell us, what is hemp passion? Why did you decide to st set up this type of business? Um, Hemp Passion, for those who don't know what it is, uh, we, we're a company that manufactures and distributes uh, hemp-based CBD products. So at the moment, we've got something about 32, 33 different products in three or four different categories. We manufacture oils uh, in different strengths, e-liquids, uh, topical creams. Uh, they've got a host of health benefits. Uh, even though we cannot make medical claims, we can say that CBD is known to aid in, etc. It's like uh, it's one of those things that everyone knows. Um, and we started it two years ago now, end of 2017, because my partner Nathan is very enthusiastic. He's been studying this topic for good almost 10 years now, almost, yeah, 10 years. And he came to me one day at Gourmet Grill, and he was like, look, there's this company, he was, he was, he was having a fit, fuming, saying that this company is, is conning everyone, basically daylight robbery, stealing their money. And I told him, well, if you feel so strongly about it, why don't you start your own one? So the next day he called me up and said, like, okay, I want to start my own one, I don't know what to do. <laughs> so I looked into it, I did a bit of research. I already, obviously I knew about cannabis, I knew, didn't know much about the, the health benefits of CBD, but I did know that America and Canada were already legalized and it was the, the natural step. Uh, CBD is what, what um, came before the legalization of medicinal cannabis and recreational. So I knew that it was good. the industry was going to go that way. <laughs> so we decided to start it. Uh, fortunately for us, we managed to get all of our products into the whole of Gibraltar, uh, all the pharmacies anyway. And then we had some European investors come to us uh, who offered us a very good deal. We said yes. Unfortunately, our business, our business has been growing every month. So, and we don't depend on Gibraltar, which is very good. <laughs> We're Brexit proof for now. <laughs> So, Anthony, you became the, the company's legal advisor, um, and you've told me yourself that you're passionate about supporting startups, even though within the firm it's not the most lucrative thing to do. Um, why did you get involved uh, with Hemp Passion, and how are you involved? Personally, I know David <laughs> at a personal level, uh, so I consider that's the Jim <laughs> thing, right? I He's consider my him a friend before before clients, but. Um, so yeah, of course, I'm happy to, to help out with, um, with any of his legal requirements. And there are lots of uh, issues that you need to consider when you're setting up a new business, uh, especially when you're bringing in uh, new investors or, or new partners. It's, it's very, you know, there are all sorts of issues uh, that need to be considered from a, from a, share, you know, from a shareholder's perspective you're basically entering into business with, with people who maybe you've met very recently. Um, so you haven't yet created, obviously there's a little bit of trust there to begin with because otherwise you wouldn't get into business with that person. But you know, from first-hand experience, I've seen so many shareholder disputes 
and often they don't have, um, they haven't prepared for that, so they haven't had uh, shareholders agreements in place, for example. Yeah. And uh, these are the things that are often overlooked um, by startups, simply because either out of naivety or because they don't want to go into that cost, they don't see it as important at, at, at the outset. Um, and, and that is something that, um, of course, we understand uh, as, a, as a law firm. Uh, you know, it's not, like I said, it's not a very lucrative business, but you never know. You're building a relationship with this client um, for the long term. You're helping them grow, and um, you want to be associated with projects that are successful. Um, you want to help people establish and... and, and um, how can I say, you want to help them sort of uh, develop their ideas and their businesses and their, their ideas, their, their projects, basically. Um, one of my clients said to me recently, which I thought was a great line, you want to turn ideas into invoices. So uh, that's, um, you know, that, that's the idea really behind, um, behind every startup, you know? You, you, you start off with a great idea um, and you just want to, you want, it to, you want to see it take off. And as a legal advisor, what we do at Hassan, we, we want to see them take off. We want to help them um, be as successful as they can be and, and maximize their potential. So I, for one, find it very fulfilling to see when a client of, of ours uh, develops and becomes very successful. For me, that, that is very fulfilling. Of course, you know, at the end of the day, we're, we're not in the business of, of giving free legal advice. But, um, but there is an element of... <laughs> I'm making a mental note here. There is, there is an element of, um, there is an element of, of you know, giving back to, to the community and, and, and uh, trying to help Gibraltar as a whole. Yeah. Do you think it's important to support as a firm in order to contribute to the ecosystem forming for more startups to thrive? Definitely. Um, and, and we try and help in, in every way, shape or form. For example, with, for example, I, I mentioned DLT again because I'm very involved in that space. But uh, we've been talking to the regulator uh, and the government about how we can make regulations um, more startup friendly. Um, and all, all, all things like, for example, um, places like Regis uh, popping up. You know, th this is a um, retail space in Gibraltar can be very expensive. Um, so, I mean, now in the online world that we live in, you know, everybody is, is, is online these days and therefore the need for big office space is um, less and less all the time. But still, you know, you need, you need some office space. Um, so uh, the fact that places like WeWork, Regis and these uh, organizations are coming to Gibraltar and setting up premises here, that is very helpful. So, David, as a local founder and now on your second business, how have you found it? Because you've sort of talked about Gourmet Grill, but getting investment is always one of the, the things that people struggle with. And how were you able to find and secure investment for your Gibraltar-based businesses? Yeah, <clears throat> I think um, in Gib it's a bit hard. The, the investment, uh, there is a couple of initiatives the government have that I don't think many people are aware of. Well, one of them is the GBNS. I'm not sure if anyone's heard of that. Gibraltar Business Nurturing Scheme that they give yeah. uh, quite a few lo and quite cheap loans. Um, and they used to have the EU funding. But apart from that, I mean, when we started Gourmet Grill, uh, we only actually got £5,000. And that's because I tried to keep it as low as possible. But we managed to do that because the lease, at, by the time, by the way, at the time that I went to get this place, I didn't know anything about a lease. I had to search it up on Google and then I had to speak to a few people. But anyway, I managed to negotiate with um, one guy who wanted to sell his lease that we could pay it monthly, so an interest fee. He was financing our lease for us, so I didn't have to put any capital up front for, for the lease. And uh, fortunately, the guy wanted to help us out as well. It's like, it's like a bit like Anthony was saying, that people want to be associated with the, the projects that are doing well and they want to help um, and then after for him passion we pretty much I did the exact same thing that I learned from Gourmet Grill I did the same with him passion I, I managed to find some suppliers who would give me a, a line of credit and I would pay them back 
as I was go going selling, so I didn't have to find mu uh, much funding because if I did have to find in Jibo, it would probably been quite hard. Yeah. It would have been quite hard. So you f for you, key, the key thing has been to keep your overheads as low as possible? But, yeah, I always wanted to keep the overheads low. I mean, the, the financing of the lease, for example, the, the overheads weren't slow because I had the lease and I had the rent yeah, of the, the premises. Point. So yeah. obviously there was significant overheads there, but it did mean that I didn't have to put down 30 or 40 grand uh, on, on, uh, on capital for the lease, which was a, for us at the time was a, was a benefit. And I just sell a load of burgers. Exactly, that was the plan. <laughs> didn't know how we were gonna do it, but we just say, okay, let's just do it. At the time I was younger, I didn't have any fear of anything. I was just like, okay, yeah, we're gonna open a burger place, we're gonna sell burgers, and let's hope that we can manage to meet the bills at the end of the month. <laughs> we did, we did, um, fortunately for a while. <laughs> and then it, the thing is with restaurants is that you have the, the ups and downs, so you need to put money away on the up months so that when it comes to the down months, you can meet all your payments. Um, but yeah, in terms of funding in Gibraltar, I think it's pretty hard, apart from those two things that I mentioned. I was fortunate enough that I learned on the first time and applied those the same principle, let's say, on the second time. But I, I think there should be something more like that. No, like, I don't know. Some, like committee or funding, like, like I think we had someone here actually, Diana, who does venture capital, but I'm not sure what, what how low they go. <laughs> so you're always you're always open for more investment for your businesses. You're always looking to to find new investment. At the moment, we don't need investment, fortunately, for us. Okay. So, well, yeah. good for you. <laughs> so. There's always room for change, Anthony. Um, and what do you think are the options and positive changes that will be made in order to help formation and support of startups from the legal perspective within the OFT, which is the Office of Fair Trade and other bodies? Because I think there's been a lot of talk about how that was very difficult for startups too. Yeah, and, and, and to be fair to the, to the OFT, they have uh, made some changes. Uh, to try and address some of those issues. So, for example, um, there is now the ability to waive the need for premises okay. if your business doesn't require premises, um, which is at, at, at least a step in the right direction. There is so much more that can be done. And um, I noticed as well uh, some incubators and accelerators uh, interested in, in exploring Gibraltar and uh, what, they, what services they can provide here. Um, because I think that we do still lack uh, that guidance. I mean, you know, we mentioned before Hassan's being willing to sort of provide service at a low cost, et cetera, when, when you know, the, the client can't, um, can't meet those, those demands. But, um, there are there, sh there, there can be so many more initiatives uh, in place to, to help support, and the likes of, of I mentioned before Regis and, and WeWork uh, is is again a step in the right direction, but there is there is so much more that, that can be done, and um, you know it's difficult to put your finger on exactly what that is, but I don't think there is enough uh, guidance uh, in Gibraltar, yeah. uh, starting in the schools. Yeah. Um, Do you think it has to start from the education definitely. level? Definitely, and, and I think it's, it's the, the, the scheme that David mentioned earlier, or was it the... Young Enterprise. No, the Young Enterprise. The Young, the young Enterprise scheme that they have now in, in the schools, I think is a great initiative. And actually they call on um, the industry in Gibraltar, professional industry, to, to help. And uh, that's worked very well, I must say. But um, I think you know they can they can do much more. They can do much more. I think it should be compulsory. I think the young enterprise in school should be compulsory, honestly, because a, a lot of the, the skills that you learn or you don't even know that you have, when you're put in that situation, you realize, ah, oh, actually, I can be a leader. Actually, I do have, I can manage people. Actually, marketing might be something that I enjoy. Yeah. And, and not only that, uh, when, you leave, when you leave school and you go to uni and you come back, chances are you're going to work in a business. So the, the younger that you're exposed to that environment, I think it's a good thing. I think it should be compulsory. Well, I, I think that they, they have done a great job, but they've always struggled to rally for support, both in the business, um, from the business side and also from the school side. Uh, but it's a very established program nowadays, and hopefully it will go from strength to strength. But I think... It, They've had it for 10 years now, so 
Yeah, it's a, it's a good initiative. <laughs> so um, we're going to go back to talking about the industry of medicinal cannabis a little bit. So what have been the benefits for you working in this uh, disruptive industry? And what do you think is the future use of medici medicinal cannabis? When we talk about medicinal cannabis as an industry, you need to, we need to divide it into sectors, let's say. Uh, the one that I'm in with Hemp Passion at the moment, which is the, the hemp-derived CBD-based products, that is completely legal uh, in the whole of Europe. Well, now there's a bit of a gray area with this new regulation that they brought in, but even though that comes from, even though hemp is a subtype of cannabis, it's considered completely different to actual medicinal cannabis like you see full on in America and in, and in Canada. Uh, Jib right now, they've, they've announced that they, they want to bring this new industry to Gibraltar, which I think is one of the most forward thinking policies that they can, they can bring, uh, especially because the, the health benefits are, you, you can't deny that. And apart from that, the, the amount of uh, money it saves the government, which is what they look at. So when it comes down, when it comes down to election, yeah, let's see how we can we can bring um, um, a surplus. Uh, it will be a huge boost to the economy. Uh, if we look at Malta, for example, uh, they legalized it about a year ago now, and they've attracted about 10, 15 like global cannabis companies already. Not to cultivate, they don't have the space, even and we're even smaller than they are. But uh, for a lot of the the registering the companies as a, as a as an entry into Europe, I think Gibraltar could easily be the same as Malta. I mean, um, but in terms of <coughs> what, it's, what it's done for us, we are now, we've moved into the medicinal cannabis space. Uh, this is like the, f the second phase of our, of our project, which is why, one of the reasons why we started um, Empassion. And obviously right now markets are limited. We're only setting up in our facility as we speak. But if you ask me that question in a year's time, I'm going to answer in more in depth. So, Anthony, there's been a government budget statement that included uh, some talk about what's going to happen in terms of Gibraltar and medicinal cannabis law regulation. So, can you talk us through that a little bit and what do you feel will be the advantages for Gibraltar? Yeah, I have to be careful with what I say on this because uh, oh, a lot of it be. is... You're a lawyer, uh, come on. <laughs> a lot of it is, is uh, not in the public domain yet. But um, yeah, definitely I think there's a lot of talk around this uh, industry. Uh, like David said, the CBD is, is one thing and that's uh, legal at the moment. There's been work on a new um, uh, drugs misuse regulations which uh, basically will allow for other um, THC products to be sold. Um, you know, there are certain restrictions, who it can be sold to, who can prescribe it, what, what um, categories of, uh, what diagnosis can be used for. So there are uh, a lot of restrictions at the moment, obviously, for obvious reasons, you know, they, they want to control it uh, from day one. But um, it's a good first step. It's a good first step. I think more is going to be done. We'll hear a lot more about this, um, I think, in the, in the next six to 12 months. Um, there are some um, interesting uh, players who are, who are um, very You've big in this industry, first. who are very big so in this coy. industry, and who, <laughs> and who I think uh, are, are being at least attracted to Gibraltar and to, and to um, explore Gibraltar and how they can um, uh, leverage off new, any new regulations that are put in place. So what exactly is going to be allowed? Is it the medical research, the cultivation? For now, for now, it's just uh, THC products, which can be which can be sold, um, but it has to be uh, prescribed by a by a certain uh, doctor with a GHA and um, with certain qualifications, and it can only be prescribed for certain illnesses such as MS. Um, I can't remember what the others were. Parkinson's? Parkinson's, MS, and, and two or three others. Okay. Okay. So. But I think what I can say is that there's also talk about um, making cultivation 
legal. Um, but that is still early days, and there's a lot of uh, lot to be done in that space. Still, I'm not sure how that will develop over the next six to twelve months. But watch this space. Yeah, you feel you're going to be more involved, do you? I think so. I think there's going to be a lot more news coming out of Gibraltar in this space. Good. Okay, so David, we we kind of round it up with a little bit of the advice and the tips. So, how would you advise other small businesses and startups to plan for things like the cost, the funding, employees? Firstly, the, I think one of the most important things is to speak to people who are in that industry already. You know, I've got I've been now in business for three and a half, four years. And I get people all the time coming to me uh, saying, oh, I want to open this. What do you think? What, what about this? And I was thinking to myself when they asked me, like, I wish I had gone and to someone and asked these questions because you can find out a lot of valuable information. Things like, like I said, that when I started going to grill, I was like, I have no fear. Let's just jump in. Let's just do it. I should have asked a lot of people a lot of questions before doing that. But obviously, I was young. I was fearless. So I just went for it. But definitely ask people in that space. Speak to people with a lot more experience. Um, obviously, the funding is obviously an issue, so I think you need to have a proper business plan, business plan in place to be able to acquire some funding. Um, what other advice? It's not as easy as you think, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> that is for sure. <laughs> what I'd like to add to that is um, that I think there's a um, misconception of uh, people who you know, have great ideas and they want to set up their new startup business. Actually, you have to live that. You have to live that business because there's so much um, that goes into it, so much work that behind the scenes that nobody sees, even before you can launch a product. Um, and I often, you know, in my line of work, I come across a lot of investment opportunities and, uh, you know, a lot of people with great new ideas, which actually, you know, I, I'm, I'm a sucker for that. I, I, for me, every idea sounds amazing. So I immediately get sort of dragged in and I, I want to help. But um, the level of, of commitment that you have to, that you have to give to, to, to starting up your own business and making it successful is something that uh, you know, it, not, not many people know. Um, and until you've experienced that, I think it's, um, it, it's, it's impossible to imagine. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's, uh, it's I, I was speaking to somebody recently who said, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd want to um, carry on, you know, with what I'm doing at the moment, but I've got this side project and I want to make it successful. I said, that's impossible, you can't do that. You can't just have something on the side and, you know, feed it every now and again um, and hope that it, you know, uh, um, becomes, becomes uh, this amazing new um, thing that everybody wants to be a part of. So um, you actually have to give it a lot of uh, attention. So you told us a little bit about um, the legislation part. I wish you could tell us more about well, watch the space. Um, but lately I've been reading articles, I think last week, about how blockchain technology is going to also become part of the um, medical cannabis industry because of the traceability of uh, sourcing the product and having the chain. Um, and that's becoming something that some of the bigger companies are going to be adopting in order to give it, to validate um, the product. So what are your thoughts on this? And how do you feel, both of you feel, both blockchain technology and the uh, the medical cannabis industry plus Gibraltar can play a big factor? I think there is a lot of overlap. And um, blockchain is, as a technology, can be used pretty much anywhere in it, with, with, any, with any business product. And um, certainly it's a very strong use case in anything where you are you know, a supply chain is, is, is of value. So, uh, I mean, we've, we've even had this conversation uh, previously about how, uh, you know, whether it's of any value to, to integrate um, blockchain technology into, into the Hemp Passion product. Um, and yeah, there are different companies. In fact, one of them is our client and uh, are setting up in Gibraltar. 
they provide blockchain as a service. So they basically um, go to any business and uh, they can integrate uh, blockchain technology into their, uh, into their systems to make them more efficient, more transparent, and, and a product like, like Impassions, this is where you know, something like this could become very handy, you know, because you, by one quick scan of a QR code, you can look at where the product originated from and, and you know, the supply chain. So. so you recently spoke to another of uh, our network mm -hmm. about um, the token uh, for your business. What are your thoughts going forward in introducing that kind of initiative or innovation into your business? Firstly, I will need to understand it more because I'm still not on the level like Anthony here who lives, breathe, lives and breathes crypto, uh, blockchain. But um, after the conversation that we had with, uh, with Malcolm, uh, I started to understand a bit more at how you could fuse both uh, industries together and I'm sure that at some point because these two industries are the hot ones at the moment someone will come up with the next big thing in the cannabis crypto uh, space but um, considering everything that we spoke about and how you can because obviously in cannabis and hemp for example if you want to now not in in the CBD industry at the moment in Europe it's not that heavily regulated which means that it's not very controlled from seed to sale. But when, you, when you're talking about medicinal cannabis or recreational cannabis, you need to have full traceability in the product. So whenever you plant a seed, you need to have the information of the day that it was planted, where that seed came from, how long it took, when it was cut, when it was cured, absolutely everything. It's like a, like a book. Um, and this is where I think in the future we'll, we'll be seeing a lot more of the uh, cannabis companies applying blockchain to the seed to sale. Well, I think it's going to happen. And we've got Facebook in the newspapers this uh, today, well, online everywhere with, uh, with their own token, Libra. So what are your thoughts on that now that we're on the tokens? We're having a bit of a door problem over there. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's all over the news. It's, it's big news. It's uh, bigger than I think people realize at this moment. But... Um, it could, there are a couple of things that are interesting about Libra, um, and I haven't really analyzed the white paper in any detail, but I did, I would, did do some bedtime reading last night on this, and uh, longer than I expected. And um, it's, it's interesting, just because it's, it's such a global brand like Facebook, which has uh, such a big user base, um, so it can really make crypto mainstream, which is something that we've been talking about over the last couple of years. Um, never before have we had the opportunity to really uh, make crypto mainstream, and I think this is what's going to happen now yeah. um, with Libra. It's, it is a cryptocurrency. There's been a lot of um, criticism of it from the crypto freaks, if you like, or, or from the purists because uh, it's not completely decentralized and it's, uh, it's not permissionless, or at least not for now. Um, it's backed by fiat assets, um, you know, and, and a lot of uh, the reasons why Bitcoin, which was the first cryptocurrency, was developed in the first place was because it, 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 they didn't, nobody trusted fiat anymore. So the fact that now they're having the Libra coin, which is backed by fiat assets, um, sort of contradicts a bit uh, what the whole uh, purpose of, of cryptocurrency was in the first place. Having said that, you know, I think the fact that we're seeing you know, big, big partners such as MasterCard, um, Uber, you know, Lyft, all of these companies are, are openly associated with Libra. Um, so we'll see. I mean, I think it's going to be a success. I think it's going to be a success, but I think um, it's, it's very different to Bitcoin, for example. It's, it's, a, it's a stable coin for starters, and um, like I said, it's backed by fiat assets. So it's very, diff it's very different to Ether or Bitcoin or your other more traditional cryptocurrencies. So I heard today there is a local base Gibraltar, you know, crypto company involved in um, 
Libra. So yeah. Zappo. Yes. <laughs> You heard too. No, it's 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 out in the open. It's in the white paper. It's, so it's, I think uh, it's it's, it's very positive news for Gibraltar as as the regulator also to build that confidence um, globally because there's no n there is no other platform that has more global reach than Facebook. So I guess we have to take it as good news. Definitely, I think it's definitely good news for the crypto industry, um, and I think it will um, start. Uh, quite possibly another bull run in the in the um, crypto markets. Okay, so just to wrap it up, uh, any tips, any advice, or any room for improvement for future businesses in Gibraltar? <laughs> That's a very wide question. <laughs> uh, room for improvement uh, in what in what sense? Sorry. So generally, what more could we be doing at a local level to to help the ecosystem? Um, anything that could be changed to help the ecosystem and then what advice you would give we've talked about it generally throughout the talk yeah. but anything that you would pinpoint I think better guidance better guidance um, I mean uh, there's a lot of good stuff already happening certainly at a, at a regulator level um, when we deal with regulators with the Financial Service Commission for example they are very open and they and they actually like to engage with the industry to see you know the regulations are important in certain industries for example uh, with with uh, medic medicinal cannabis and with with blockchain for example regulation in these industries are very is very important but the, it, the right regulation is important and um you can't just regulate for the sake of regulating. So it's important that you have that the regulator has that relationship with the industry to basically reach out and um, hear out the industry. Regulations have to be industry-led, I think. Um, and when you do that, and and you are able to sit in a room with the regulators, with the government, and Gibraltar is, is is great for that, right? It's so small, it's so flexible um, that you can quite easily achieve um, such meetings at relatively short space of time. Um, and, um, and I think this is, this is very beneficial. This is one of the, the, the larger, benef the biggest benefits that we have in Gibraltar, that we're able to influence um, uh, regulations um, in, a very, in a very positive way. Okay. David? I think, uh, especially in my industry, Anthony hit the nail on the head. Um, regulation is very, very important. The right regulation, especially in an industry like CBD and medicinal cannabis, because what you're seeing now, for example, out there is um, a lot of, uh, uh, to put it in a very blunt way, cowboy companies. Uh, they see an opportunity, they see a market that's hot, and they just get in, make some products. Some of them are even making it in their own home and then selling it in pharmacies. I mean, how, you wouldn't have that anywhere else in the world. Some guy making a product at home and selling it in from a pharmacist. So I think regulation is, uh, is definitely what's needed in my industry, but what Anthony said is very true, that we're small enough and we're smart enough to be able to bring out a, a globally recognized framework that can boost business. So I think that's pretty, and the funding, obviously, like I mentioned earlier, funding's important. Without funding, you don't go anywhere. <laughs> Yeah, just the last thing on, on that point. I think regulation can, can, can make uh, Gibraltar very popular and very attractive, but it can also kill industries. Cycle, yeah. So if, if the regulation is not the right type of regulation, you know, n nobody's going to be attracted to this jurisdiction. So it's important that we always uh, keep our eyes on that. So it's time to just say a quick thank you, both of you, obviously, for joining me. I know, David, that uh, it's your first time, but I hope it's the first time of many other talks that you give because what you're doing is great, and the fact that you're so young and you're Gibraltarian and you've taken the plunge is something that I really admire, and I'm really glad to have hosted you on the stage. Anthony, thank you for being our guest for the second time, <laughs> and I'm sure we'll have lots to speak about again, especially when eToro are in Gibraltar. Thank you. Thank <laughs> I'll say you it publicly. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, um, thank you to the team, obviously, that helps put this together. We have a new team member, Paul, over there. I'm just going to embarrass you. Um, and Anton, who does the filming for us. And obviously, all you guys who, who come as attendees. 
Our sponsors, our venue partner, the World Trade Center, Gibraltar Finance and Abacus. And well, have some drinks and some nibbles and enjoy the networking. Thank you. <laughs>